All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to data sharing for qualitative research. Um, I'm bit, my name is Crystal Stelton Pohl. I'm with Dartmouth Center for Program Design and Evaluation and the Center for Open Science. And I'm very excited for this panel today in which we'll talk about um, some common concerns around um, data sharing for qualitative and mixed methods researchers and, and also some potential solutions. Um, today, I am joined by Kristen Eldon. Wiley, uh, Sebastian Karcher, and Rachel Renbarger. Um, just as some folks are are coming in, um, I'll go ahead and, and give us a, a look at what we'll be doing today um, and then let folks introduce themselves and then we can go ahead and, and get started. Um, so um, first, uh, we're going to have some comments about the importance of open data from a funder's perspective. Uh, and then we're going to follow up with some discussion about some common considerations from a qualitative perspective when it comes to data sharing. Um, and then we'll talk about some, some potential solutions that have come up. And then hopefully we'll have plenty of space um, for folks to ask any questions. Um, there's the chat and also the Q&A function uh, through Zoom. And so feel free uh, while the, the presenters are talking to ask any questions uh, that you may have that come up. And then we will try to answer those during the discussion section and also allow the panelists to, to discuss with one another anything that comes up during the the panels. So um, with that, let's go ahead and, and let folks introduce themselves. Um, Kristen, why don't we start with you? Sure. Thank you, Crystal. Um, I'm, my name is Kristen Eldon Wiley. I am a senior program manager at Templeton World Charity Foundation. Um, so I will be here talking about uh, the funder's perspective of the importance of open data. Um, I, as a part of my senior project uh, program manager role, I'm responsible for um, uh, promoting best practices of open research, both within the foundation and with our with our grantees. Thank you, uh, Rachel. Hello, everyone. My name is Rachel Renbarger. I am a U.S. education researcher at FHI three hundred and sixty, which is a global nonprofit. I am currently excited to talk to you about open science, mostly because I was trained as a quantitative researcher and then have transitioned to qualitative and mixed methods. Uh, right as you know, the open science movement was happening. So I have a lot of thoughts from uh, my people and others around this topic. Thanks. Thanks. And Sebastian. Uh, hi, I'm Sebastian Karcher. I'm the Associate Director of the Qualitative Data Repository, and I'm also a uh, faculty in political science here at Syracuse University. Um, and so we archive qualitative data, and I also do a lot of work on uh, research transparency and qualitative and multi-method research. Uh, and so I've heard a lot of the concerns that many of you probably arrived at today. And um, I'm not going to dispel them all, but I'm going, I also don't like the word solution. I would maybe have called it approaches to common concerns had I phrased that. Um, and, and that's kind of the perspective that I'll try to uh, provide. Awesome. Thanks, Sebastian. All right. And with that, I will um, I will get off a of video and I will um, cede control to Kristen. Thanks. Thanks, Crystal. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm probably preaching to the choir here a little bit, but um, I'm just going to go briefly over why um, we think that uh, open data is important. So as a funder, um, we want our research uh, to, that we fund to have an impact and accelerate discovery. Um, probably nothing new. Um, and we also, but we also want to know that if the research data we fund is, but we also know that if the research data we fund is shared, the potential to accelerate discovery um, grows even larger. Uh, by adding transparency, sharing data enhances trust in other outputs and it increases reproducibility and reuse and makes it easier to get to new discoveries by building on existing knowledge. Um, there's an, also another reason we want data to be, um, uh, the data we fund to be shared is to increase equity. We want the research that we fund to be available to anyone with an internet access um, and data sets are a part of the research that we fund. Um, go to the next slide. 
Um, but we also understand that it's not enough just to put the data out there and that there's no point in sharing the data if it's not transparent and reusable. Uh, we know that managing, preserving, and when appropriate, sharing data sets is hard. It takes planning and it takes resources. Um, guidelines, we think, can kind of move us from the values and principles of open data to the practice of open data. It can provide practical tools and training and facilitate and build infrastructure. I don't think there's much impact in saying um, you think it's important, but mapping out how it will be done takes us a step closer to actuality. Uh, we think that guidelines have the potential to provide a push to um, plan appropriately. It can help the researcher determine if they have enough capacity or enough money or enough resources to meet the guidelines for sharing. Um, guidelines also set clear expectations for both sides. Applicants and grantees will understand clearly what we want as a funder. And then once these plans are outlined in an application, the, us as a funder will understand clearly um, how the project team plans to share and manage the data sets. Uh, but um, it's time for me to get off my high horse. Um, as a funder, we can come with a big picture and say all of this, um, but I'm not in day-to-day -day, um, managing a pile of data. At TWCF, we fund different projects uh, from hypothesis testing research projects uh, to projects building uh, theoretical models and defining measurements. Uh, and we've heard that pre-registering qualitative research projects or sharing quality, qualitative uh, data sets um, may be different than uh, working with uh, quantitative data. Um, we've heard a little bit about the challenges of sharing data and participant consent. How can these two requirements be met in tandem? Um, we've listened to the concern about the challenging the challenge of finding the balance between the context and confidentiality. How can you share enough information um, about a qualitative um, data set so the reuser has enough context, but the identity of subjects is still protected? Hence, I'm going to be quiet now and <laughs> share and really grateful to listen to the real experts in this area. Um, and of this important topic and eager to hear about their experiences um, and advice. Thanks. Sorry, it took a minute for me to stop remote, but I gave it. <clears throat> oh, there we go. Okay. So thank you for that introduction. Uh, I do have a lot of thoughts about this topic, and this is my perspective as a researcher and only my perspective. I want to give you that caveat. Um, I've been talking to a lot of my friends about this topic, though, and so I've been incorporating some of their feedback and their questions and their concerns about this into this uh, talk today. And something that I just want to start with is what even counts as data. I know Sebastian will be talking about what do we do uh, with some of these questions. So look forward to that. But some of the perspectives that I've heard is what do I even count as a qualitative researcher? So we might be working with interview participants. We might be thinking about focus groups. We might be doing observations. We also do a lot of background work as a researcher and qualitative work. So we take researcher memos we talk about our own experience. We provide thick descriptions of where we're at when we're providing the focus groups, where we're observing. So we have both the participant side of things, what they actually say, and is that audio, is that video? We have the researcher perspective too of what the researcher is adding because in qualitative, the researcher is a part of the study. There is They say that we're an instrument because our biases and our perspectives can absolutely influence the data that we collect. And it's important not to say that we're getting rid of bias, but thinking about it, thinking about how it might impact data collection, data analysis, modeling, all of these sorts of things. And so when we're thinking about doing open data and open data sharing, what am I allowed to put online? Is it just stuff that I've collected and that I'm bringing to the table? Or am I also thinking about what participants are saying? 
Oh, and there's thousands more from this. I was trying to think of the most basic and the most common examples, but there's a billion more. Other questions that come up uh, in conversations with other researchers is what did we say to our participants whenever we started this? So we have obviously our IRB requires consent form language around this. So did we include that before we started collecting data? Did we tell them what the topic really was or did we have some sort of deception involved that can be common? In qualitative research more than quantitative, I've seen much more consideration and understanding of asking members about their feedback of the data. So they call that maybe member checking or validation. So thinking about that as an other step of this involving participants in the data sharing process and asking them what the topic is, are they comfortable? Uh, I was talking to a colleague who was talking about their experiences as a faculty member in university and they knew that they were likely going to be outed if they even said their university or their gender. And so they did not want to be given any piece of their information online. They were very scared because they did not have tenure. And I think importantly, from a researcher perspective, we want to tell them what the point of open data is. Is it because our committee said that we need to? Is it because the grant funder said that we need to? Is it to help create access for other communities? Personally, that's more of why I have done it in the past is to help other people who are interested in doing similar types of research. Look at the interview questions. Look at what a code book looks like. There are many young researchers or early career researchers who may not have had experience in specific methods. And so for me, it's really important to help the next generation see what is possible in that area. And so all of these different rationales that we might have for sharing our data are important to our participants. And we need to make sure that they know what that is so that they can make an informed decision about data sharing as well. And then obviously telling them what would be available. Is it to other people like me, the other Rachels who are not concerned about what university you're at? Or is it to people who might have a malicious intent? Um, it's very likely that in this day and age, there's a lot of polarization and politicization over topics. And for many people, they are not willing to have that additional risk. But maybe they would if they knew it's only available upon request. Maybe they would if it's not their video, but maybe it's the audio that's being shared. Or maybe it's not the question they're concerned about is not the one that you might actually be sharing. Maybe you're sharing the data about uh, a description of their setting, but not necessarily their experiences with that setting. And so thinking about what participants might be comfortable with and what you're comfortable with also, uh, your knowledge and your why, I think are really important here. I want to have a very quick example. Um, this is a video that I pulled from TikTok, one of my favorite places to be whenever I'm unwinding. And this is online footage of a woman in an airport um, pretty recently within the past few months. And so as you start watching, I'd like you to think about if you were going to share this data, what might it look like? What options do you have in terms of communicating what you need to communicate about the essence of the video? Which options might be better for sharing with the public? Would it be transcript? Would it be video? Would it be audio? And then which ones might be best for private use? So I am at home enjoying a nice evening of scrolling social media when this comes across my timeline. <laughs> Oh, 
So I am at home enjoying a nice evening of scrolling social Thank media you, when this comes across my timeline. Oh no. We'll let you go back to this slide. Oh, there we go. Okay. So thinking about this video, let's say you are researching. I don't know why you'd be researching uh, TikTok videos, but maybe you're thinking of a dramatic example and an observation that you had, right? If I'm the lady in the white sweater, do I want this shirt publicly? Most likely I do not. Do I want a transcript of the experience. Maybe I would be more comfortable with that. Do I want this TikTok commentary included in what is shared? Where a man is eating popcorn is possible entertainment around what may or may not be a very difficult event for this person. So thinking about what aspects that we share and in which capacity are very important for us to think about before we even bring it to the participants, right? If we have participants who might be going through mental health challenges, political issues, uh, relationship issues, I'm not saying that we can't share anything, right? I think we can be cognizant and propose a solution that provides a feeling of safety and security for our participants. And it might require more work from us to add an additional layer of transcription, um, anonymity, confidentiality. But is that worth your rationale or your why? If it is to make sure that other people trust your study, that might be important to you. But maybe it's not worth the risk of your participants not feeling okay. So here are just a few examples um, that I thought just spark ideas um, and then pass it over to the expert who can tell us now what do we do uh, with all of these uh, potential problems. All right. So while I wait to get control over the slides, um, uh, so so there's essentially three uh, three main areas that we hear at uh, uh, QDR um, that people are concerned about when they think about sharing qualitative data. Um, and uh, the first one of that, and that loomed large and entirely unsurprisingly, um, though very originally in how she presented it, but entirely unsurprisingly, is uh, the question of ethics. Um, and uh, there's right, there's questions exactly what Rachel brought up. It's about consent, it's about confidentiality, and it's about access. Um, there's also the second a large um kind of group of concerns and questions that we hear came up perhaps most clearly in the first slide that Rachel presented. Um, and you hear that especially from people who situate themselves more uh, strongly in kind of a social constructivist uh, tradition of, of qualitative research um, is broadly around context or if you want to be a fancy about epistemology. Uh, to what extent can others uh, understand the data uh, or understand them in a way that's meaningful in the context of my research? 
Uh, and then thirdly, they're just practical questions, right? Like how, how do I do this? Uh, how do I do this without it sucking up a prohibitively large amount uh, of my time? And as I said at the beginning, uh, I don't really want to give you solutions, solutions in the sense of that. I think these are solved problems. I think these are good questions and I think people are right to ask them. Uh, I think there are approaches to, um, engage with these questions and not say, okay, ethics, human participant, qualitative data can't be shared. We're done. Uh, so, so we can do better than that, but it's important to take these questions seriously and to think uh, hard about how we address them. Uh, and we are also going to address them differently for essentially every uh, single research project, although otherwise it wouldn't make sense for me to talk to you about in uh, for 10 minutes. Uh, there are obviously some some general uh, ideas and things that we can do. Um, so first of all, you know, the big questions uh, about ethics. First one is about consent, right? Do I have to get consent? That one has a clear answer. You have to get consent if you want to share data in almost all situations. We effectively, for example, won't uh, take human participants' data, whether it's identified or de-identified, if you don't have consent from participants to sharing it. Won't that deter participation, right? If you tell them I'll share your data, uh, will they still want to be in your study? And even if they will, uh, won't it change how they talk to you? Um, secondly, most IRBs in the US, uh, ethics review boards and other uh, places um, include promises of confidentiality. It's not always the case. There's a big uh, debate, for example, in ethnography, whether, uh, whether that makes sense. Um, but I would say 90% of the time we promise confidentiality to participants. Uh, how can I keep that promise when sharing data? And even if I de-identify the data, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how we might approach that, um, are, are they perhaps still too sensitive to, to that, just publish them on essentially the wide internet? And does that prevent me from sharing the data? That's kind of a broad swath of the ethical question. There's more, but that kind of seemed to be the most important uh, set for me. So the first thing I want to talk about is informed consent. Um, and I want to start with an example. This is um, uh, from a study uh, that Alicia van der Vosse and uh, Jen Miller at the Guttmacher Institute did. Uh, these were um, cognitive interviews on, uh, on abortion. Um, they interviewed about 50 people, uh, 50 cis women to be precise, uh, half of whom had had abortions, uh, half hadn't, uh, half of them in Wisconsin, half of them in New Jersey. Um, and um, the interviews were designed to kind of get at conceptual questions of measurements. So they were working to refine the measurements that Guttmacher uses in their large um, abortion quantitative uh, studies, but they're still, you know, uh, fairly sensitive. And uh, we uh, worked together on this uh, consent form, and uh, then they worked internally with it and with their IRB. Uh, and what they came up with is, um, that they um, mentioned as part of the consent language that if you agree, the transcript of your interview may be shared with researchers at other organizations. Note the language researchers at other organizations there. We will take out or change any information that could identify you before sharing. You can be in the study whether you agree to data sharing or not. And then <clears throat> a little further down, uh, People gave their consent to be in the study, and then right after that was an opt-in, uh, right? Um, do you agree to allow a written copy of your interview to be shared with other researchers in the future? So fairly specific about what would be shared, uh, too. Um, now, the cool thing that Alicia and Jen did, uh, they actually rolled this larger study, which is also, I think, now published as a preprint, um, they rolled into that a study on uh, informed consent that we published in qualitative health research last year. Um, and so uh, I'm going to invite you, and this chat is open, I believe, uh, to guess what percentage of participants, knowing what you know now about the study, opted into data sharing. I'm going to just give you a minute, just uh, uh, in, uh, just put a percentage guess in, in the chat. Uh, 
All right. First of all, no one has read my study yet. Uh, go read the paper. But um, so we have estimates all over the place. Uh, I think I saw 10 to 100 uh, percent. Vicky, always the optimist. Hi, Vicky. Um, and um, the actual number is uh, 92 percent of participants opted in. Right. And I think um, <clears throat> that is remarkable. Um, and uh, um, shows that um, kind of there is a willingness of participants um, to uh, to uh, to have data shared even on fairly sensitive uh, topics. Um, they were Allegra is asking whether in the chat whether they have had to do two IRBs. They were able to wrap the entire thing into a single IRB uh, application because the informed consent part of the study was fairly short and essentially no risk. So, so that didn't actually add up, uh, add a lot of overhead. And um, you read the paper, there's actually a lot of uh, some concern that they raise and how well people understand data sharing. So I'm just presenting you part of uh, what they found here. Um, and um, uh, so I do think we need a lot more research on informed consent on data sharing. Uh, and I encourage you to do things like that and better understand if you're asking these types of questions, what participants understand, how they react, uh, et cetera. This is just one study. It's not the definite final result on on the question. Um, so some uh, some considerations as you craft informed consent. Um, be really transparent about data use. It's about uh, in uh, informed consent um, after all. Um, but remain intelligible, right? So um, uh, Gutmacher, I think, has a rule of thumb that they want to be at a third grade, I want to say, reading level. Um, um, that obviously depends on uh, who you study and uh, who your participants are, right? If you do elite interviews, you probably don't have to do that. If you uh, interview people with uh, very low education levels, uh, you need to uh, adjust accordingly. Um, but uh, you have to say what you're going to do. Don't try to skirt it. Uh, that's unethical. Um, don't go in there expecting that participants are not going to share. A lot of participants and other studies have found that in both quant and qual are very interested and willing to uh, support science. Many, most of the, a lot of the time at least, that's why they're in your study in the first place, why they're volunteering or um, at least with a relatively limited amount of money we sometimes offer uh, are in the study. Um, in some cases, they may just trust you. In a lot of cases, they trust you as a scientist. Um, Opt-in consent, as I just showed, I think is a really great option, especially for qualitative research. Um, right, It prevents that uh, risk that you have of people not wanting to be in the study because they have to share their data. So that's good for the validity of your study. It also is, I think, highly ethical to give your participants more agency over the research process and what happens with their data. So it's good in that sense. Uh, IRBs are familiar with that type of thing. It's a fairly common med in medical research. There's a reasonably large literature on this that typically refers to this as tiered consent. So with most IRBs, you won't run into problems. Um, sorry for the non-Americans for the IRB language, just, you know, replaced by ethics board or whatever it's called uh, where you are. Um, what I would say is be careful in using this for quantitative studies because having people individually opt out of a quantitative data set ruins your uh, computational reproducibility of your data. Uh, so I've done this once for a survey and I've uh, regretted it. Um, but for qualitative data where we don't run, you know, computational reproducibility in the first place, I think it's, it's really terrific in a lot of situations. Um, Confidentiality, right? Um, what we actually see is that it's exceedingly rare for um, interview or even audio data of qualitative studies to be shared. There are a couple of examples, and they tend to be uh, highly respected. ICPSR, for example, has a large classroom uh, study with lots of videos. Um, 
And that's quite difficult to get access uh, and approval to and uh, only through their virtual enclave, et cetera. So it can be done, but most shared qualitative data that we have is in textual form, which makes it, of course, much more realistic to de-identify. There is, depending on the type of research you do, of course, a loss of richness uh, there. Um, if you're de-identifying uh, qualitative data, uh, I have a couple of, of general uh, guidelines here. I'm just going to kind of uh, let you read through this. Um, I'm happy to answer more uh, questions on that. One thing that I want to highlight, though, is that there really is is a balance, right? There is no hard and fast rules. You have to do that. You have to do this. Um, you have to kind of think about how much can I take away keeping the data as a valuable, rich resource, and how much do I have to uh, put away um, how, how much have, do I have to take away for it in o order to be de-identified? Uh, thinking about this uh, a little bit further, um, I often think of data as kind of a two, two by two spectrum between identifiability and risk. And those don't necessarily go hand in hand, right? So identifiability is how easy would, might it be to identify uh, people from the contextual information that is often enriched qualitative transcripts. And the other part is how sensitive is the information. And so to take go back to to a study, for example, a qualitative study on abortion, given the uh, debate in the U.S., uh, it's quite sensitive, right? The risk is fairly high, especially for people with abortion histories. Um, but since there are so many people with abortion uh, histories, if you um, interview fairly randomly sampled people with abortion histories, it's relatively easy uh, to de-identify that data properly. Uh, so in the uh, case of that of that Gutmacher data, we had that kind of roughly qualified in that bottom left quote, uh, quadrant where it's high risk data, but the identify we are very, very confident about the de-identification uh, of those data. And there are other cases uh, where things do go hand in hand, right? If you do elite interviews with Chinese dissidents, it's highly sensitive and uh, the identifiability um, is high. So at that point, you know, maybe consider is this data that really needs uh, sharing, right? Not all data can be reasonably shared and the safety of your participants is obviously way more important than uh, sharing uh, the data. Uh, there's also trade-offs within the data, right? And that's tricky for qualitative data if we think about reuse, because what you would do typically when you share the data is uh, you, you may remove a little bit more about, say, you don't care about geography, so maybe you remove a little bit more geographic information, say you don't say uh, the city where an interview was in, but then you can add maybe a little bit more about the profession uh, someone has, uh, something along those lines. Um, and, and there is a trade-off, and that's obviously not always ideal for reuse because your reuser may care about something else, uh, but th that's the best you can do, and just kind of be aware of that trade-off. You look as you de-identify uh, to your data uh, as a whole. And finally, de-identification uh, works together with access controls. Um, so, for example, if I do interviews in a small town, um, People would recognize their neighbors, even if I remove a lot of information, just, you know, by turns of phrases that they use, etc. cetera. Um, but if I then add some level of access controls, maybe only for researchers or some other, you know, reasonable thing on top of the data, other researchers would not be able to re-identify that uh, person. So access controls and de-identification uh, can work together to uh, maintain the confidentiality, assuming, again, that that's actually what you want and what your participants, more importantly, want. Um, talking about access controls, uh, right, there is this this phrase that gets cited over and over again by the European Union, as open as possible, as close as necessary. We really, at, at uh, QDR, very insistent about qualitative data doesn't need to be open data in the strict sense of the term, right? Like open license, everyone can just go and download it. Um, talked about the identification. If 
in some cases, you may think about like a strongly de-identified public use data set, something more restricted that may be at more risk of de-identification, but it has significantly higher hurdles for access. A, a common thing that one can do is just uh, put an embargo on data. Sometimes just doing one or three years uh, may be enough to get people um, uh, to get people uh, out of risk. Like if you're if you're having um, we have one data for example, uh, one data set for example that was on uh, on um, on court diversion processes for uh, for uh, sex workers, and the data came in I think five or ten years after the study was done. Uh, so so people had kind of long, uh, most of them long cycled out, and would have been much harder to identify them. So so lower risk. Um, there's access by application, and uh, that can be very simple, uh, right? In some many cases for QDR data, we just check, are you who you say you are? Do you have a reasonable plan what you're going to do with the data? Uh, do you have a reasonable da uh, plan to keep your data uh, safe while you're using it? And then finally, um, will you get rid of it once you're done with your study and you need to confirm that in writing? But but that's a process we can turn around in 24 hours. Other things are more complicated. If there is personal information still in the data, we'd require uh, you to run your own IRB to get access and so on and so on. Um, and then finally, um, there is access using virtual or physical enclaves uh, that um, ICPSR offers. We only offer the physical version, which means you'd have to come travel to Syracuse, which is beautiful, but very few data sets are worth that level of dedication to get access. Um, some other things kind of that, that people have requested um, we put into access conditions uh, for data. Most of the time we would manage the access to the data based on um, based on uh, what depositors tell us. So we always have conversation with depositors and they're kind of in the driver's seat and we make recommendations, but they have the last word. Um, we do for some studies um, offer depositor approved access. Uh, I, I've seen Vicky is in the audience. So she deposited data uh, together with a group where they interviewed uh, people working in libraries and we're very concerned that there could be retribution. So they wanted to have, they wanted to know who, who requests access to the data to make sure that those aren't safe people linked to their supervisors. And so that's a case where, uh, where we wrote depositor approved access, um, into, uh, the access conditions. Um, Then uh, looking at the time, I probably want to wrap up in five minutes. Uh, the context is really important, even more. It's always important when we share data, right? Like if you just get a quantitative data set, you get survey data without uh, a questionnaire, et cetera. It's also not understandable. I would argue it's even more important for qualitative data because as Rachel says, there's so much going on there. Um, and here's some of the things that we're suggesting, right? Like we always ask for descriptive documentation, right? What's the project background? What are the methods used? How did you recruit your participants, et cetera? We also try to get as much of the materials used in that process. So questionnaires, focus groups, uh, guides, consent scripts uh, when, uh, when people are willing to share them, recruitment flyers, online ads, et cetera. And if anything that gives you kind of that tangible feeling, okay, this is what actually happened. This is how people got into the research process, et cetera. Um, and then there's method specific documentation. That's one of the places where it's going to vary a lot how your data and documentation look depending on your methods, right? So that could be a sense of the reflexivity and positionality uh, that went into the data that could very well be part of the documentation. Uh, it could be code books or coding ma manuals and, and many more things like, uh, uh, again, d depends on the method. One thing that we highlight is, and that also kind of ties back to the opt-in consent is, uh, be specific about what isn't included, right? What can you not include because it's uh, you didn't get approval from the participants, you didn't get approval from the IRB, uh, you didn't 
personally feel uh, comfortable with it. For example, field notes in many ethnographic traditions are incredibly personal and are intended to be incredibly personal. And if we kind of told people up front, um, you know, you have to share them, they wouldn't work the way they're intended to work. Um, and and that's perfectly fine. Again, you don't have to share every little bit, uh, but it makes sense to say, okay, this exists in principle, but uh, these bits of information are not there. Um, I'll point out that a lot of good descriptive uh, documentation is essentially long form versions of what's required in many reporting guidelines, such as COREC. Um, those aren't without uh, their justified criticism, but they're kind of good guidelines about the types of information that's useful to to collect. And um, Correct kind of works a little bit more checklisty than it would like I would like it to be, uh, but gives you kind of a good sense of of what type of things should you be looking at. Um, I also want to raise that even with all of this, that doesn't mean. Um, that uh, data reusers uh, necessarily uh, will have the same understanding or let alone be able to, you know, reproduce your results, right? Um, A, you will always know most about your study. B, you know, positionality is specifically means that other people won't interpret the data exactly the same way. Um, and that's fine. And, and one uh, piece that I wrote together with, with my co-curators, uh, we refer to this process of kind of adding documentation as uh, enabling epistemically responsible reuse. So this idea that we put people in a situation where they can make an informed judgment about what they understand about the data and what they don't understand and can reuse it responsibly. You won't be able to do the same study, but you may still be able to do interesting uh, work if you have enough context and also if you know what context and what additional information that was present for the original researcher is not in your study. Uh, and finally, practical considerations. I want to be very transparent. This does take time. Uh, if you have rich qualitative interviews and you have 50, 60, 70 interviews, de-identifying them uh, takes time. And there is no, you know, um, there there is uh, ways to expedite it a little bit. People are developing kind of machine learning based tools, but even the most kind of optimistic of those tools uh, say, you know, this is a human in the loop to, uh, tool. So, so you have to accept or reject um, every option. Um, you can make it easier, right? Um, and I've seen a lot of data librarians in uh, the audience. Uh, they're the type of people who you consult about, uh, how can I uh, build something like data sharing into my process? Uh, how can I do good uh, data management? Those sorts of things. Um, so talk to your local uh, data librarians. Um, you can also come talk to us, but local resources are awesome. Um, so things that could include the, is think about de-identification right during kind of your first pass through the data, kind of take some notes uh, on that so you don't have to have an entirely separate read through all your transcripts for de-identification. Um, Think about, you know, how am I going to share this as you manage and organize uh, your files, kind of think through the entire process as you set up your original organization. Uh, so so it's relatively straightforward to pull out uh, the files th uh, that you're eventually going to share. Very importantly, for all sorts of purposes, uh, don't uh, procrastinate on the documentation. Write things up as you uh, do your research, both, again, for your own sake, but also uh, because it will make the documentation easier to create uh, in the end. And then importantly, make sure that the various things that you're planning to do uh, and promising various entities like your funder and your IRB uh, actually match, right? We've seen less of this now, but we still occasionally see people promising one thing in a data management plan and another thing in an IRB. And that's obviously a bad situation. You have to go with the IRB because ethics from... Um, transparency in that case, uh, but it's a bad look if you made a promise to your funder um, and you can't comply with it because uh, you made a different promise to your participants. And that's it for me. And I saw lots of questions coming in. So I hope Mark is keeping them organized.
Uh, yeah. Uh, really briefly, before we get into that, I'd, I have a quick commercial break, and then I'd love to stop sharing my screen so that um, folks can focus on the panelists. Um, on March 9th and 10th, uh, we have the Open Scholarship Practices and Education Research on Conference again. Uh, registration is open for this. It's a free virtual uh, conference. So for folks that are interested in learning more about open science practices and the social sciences, but especially in education research, um, please uh, take a look at the website and see if you'd like to join us for that. Um, and with that, um, let's stop the share. And um, yes, Mark, if you could start us off with uh, some questions. Yeah, so we ended up getting two main questions that were in the chat. First is, in timed embargo, is it common to have the data sharing be timed differently from the time of publication? Or would the timed embargo include the time of publication? And I think that was directed to Sebastian. Yeah, so um, that really depends. And I think time, uh, and I mean, Time of publication, I assume that's the time of publication of the associated work. And so how an embargo looks like is that the metadata right, uh, is public. So you see, okay, there is this study and it has these files and the files have kind of a clear label that say won't be accessible until January 2024 or, or something like that. That's how uh, this typically works. Uh, whether that's acceptable for a publication, most journals currently don't have super strict rules for sharing qualitative research. So for most purposes, it probably would be okay. If you want to publish in PROS, uh, which has strict rules, it probably won't be. Uh, so, so that's kind of the, the rough guidance uh, on that. Uh, publishers you'd have to talk to. Most publishers kind of want their data published sooner rather than later. But if you can make a good case and it's, Right, like we typically kind of say, like twelve months is reasonable if it's just you know for your own sake. You want to get your publications out. If you want to go longer, uh, it could probably have another reason, like an ethical reason, why you can't share it yet. Awesome, thank you. We have another question from Agnes, which actually generated a little bit of conversation. Her question was: the opt-in consent form asked about sharing the data with other researchers. But how do we know that other researchers would access, I mean, excuse me, that only other researchers would access the data? Couldn't anyone get access and then use the data against someone? Like, for example, if the participant shared negative perceptions of their employer, the employer can seek out the data. Um, Katie Corker, who is our one of our colleagues, responded that some repositories have a gating process so that other researchers must authenticate prior to access and use ICPSR, for an example. I didn't know if you guys wanted to elaborate on that or give any thoughts. Um, yeah, so every repository handles this somewhat differently. Um, but so if you specifically say other researchers, you should, that should, in my opinion, be reflected in how you share the data. So the data uh, of that study are actually shared on QDR. Um, and we have access conditions, uh, access controls on those. So if you want access to the data, uh, you need to you know, essentially fill out a form, tell us, uh, how you gonna use the data, or also sign a contract that um, binds you to destroying the data and not sharing it with anyone else, uh, right? So you can't kind of uh, distribute it on. Um, and um, that still le le leaves a minimal risk, right? Like if there is a really sloppy or dishonest uh, requester, um, it is a contract and uh, not, you know, uh, something that we can enforce beyond that. But um, so, so that's kind of what that promise is built on. Uh, there are additional technical means that you can take, but they're costly and, and high efforts, like the virtual enclave. And even there, you know, you can always take screenshots if you're malevolent. But but that's kind of the, the general, my, my general thinking on that. Your consent form could match what actually happens with the data. And so if you're planning on access controls, you can write kind of more restrictive use cases in there. And if you're planning to put it on a public access uh, repository or make it public access through ICPSR or QDR, that could be reflected. Awesome, thank you. And I think a follow-up question we had from that is what are the panel's views on share upon request as a mechanism for data sharing? I don't want to do all the talking. I'm sure other people have opinions on this. 
I'm not technically on the panel, but I can I can uh, hmm. I can pop in as a mixed methods researcher um, and open science advocate um, and just say that I, I find that that is often less than ideal um, because um, as we've seen, as a lot of folks that have been working in this area, even for just quantitative data, um, they find that researchers often don't respond to those requests or they start adding in, like if it's, you know, adding in, um, I guess, requirements and those requirements might not be consistent across requesters, depending on what their feel of why the person is asking for, for data. Um, so I think, I think if you're going to have a share upon, I think if you're going to have a share upon request, um, policy for your lab, you need to outline specifically under what conditions you're going to share the data and, and like what your responsibilities are going to be. Like I will respond within five working days or whatever. Like, I think that there needs to be a method for you to, to hold yourself accountable or for another person to hold you accountable for sharing that data. Um, because otherwise it's way too easy to be like, I don't like the vibe of this person. I'm not sharing my data with them, but I'm going to share my data with this person that I know agrees with me or, you know, whatever. I think, I think that that can get into really murky territory, which is why I like the idea of repositories where um, those access controls are set up and then and then the, the repository handles um, those requests. That's me personally. I don't know if others on the panel have different thoughts. I've had pretty similar negative responses where I've either been ghosted or the email was no longer valid in some instances because they change institutions or what have you. So I think the idea to have it in a repository and say what the situation will be uh, when someone requests, I think is very strong. And I think coming from a researcher, when funding ends, I don't know how to take on that responsibility after funding ends to, let's say someone contacts me five years after still planning for that while you have the funding uh, so that you don't maybe get too much of a workload on the back end when you don't have the capacity for it. Yeah, and, and I mean, just to add to that, right, like even if you're the best intentioned researcher, right, we spend a lot of time thinking about uh, how we make sure our data never gets lost, right? We have, I think, five copies of every data three different regions, uh, three different uh, servers. Um, so uh, even if you have the best intention, uh, keeping data usable and safe for 10 years, uh, you know, stuff happens. And you're no specialist in preventing stuff from happening to your data. And you, you don't necessarily need to be for that those kind of long terms that we want data be available, which is, again, where the repositories come in. Awesome. Thank you. And then the last question we have, which was directed to Sebastian, but anyone's open to, to respond. Could you summarize some of the criticisms of CoreQ, C-R-E-Q? I hope I said that right. No, it's it's correct. And those are uh, the consensus requirements for evaluating qualitative research or something like that. It's uh, someone can find the, if if you look on the equator, equator initiative, they have kind of reporting guidelines for all types of different research uh, and CORIC is the most widely used for qualitative research specifically um, for uh, focus groups and interviews. Um, and it's like cited, I don't know, 50,000 times or so. Um, and uh, there's essentially two problems with uh, this that uh, are kind of increasingly voiced. One is that it's kind of muddled uh, which, uh, which methodological um, perspective this represents. So some, and some of the questions um, kind of, they claim to be uh, methodologically neutral, but then you find things like saturation in there, which is specifically a concept from grounded theory, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, people who are kind of more strongly um, constructivist again, uh, like um, Victoria Brown uh, of thematic analysis, uh, same, that one has 150,000 citations, so I guess she wins. Uh, 
um, she is very down on that because she thinks kind of it puts people into a more positivist kind of checklist approach to evaluating qualitative research than is reasonable. Uh, so that's the one set of concerns, and I think those are the more important concerns. There's also a recent article, and I'm sorry, I don't have the uh, citation right here, but uh, that try to replicate what they claimed they did in terms of uh, fine. So what they, how they arrived at their criteria is essentially sort of systematic review um, where they claim to search all sorts of criteria that people um, used and then use uh, kind of a, a coding and collapsing process to come up with their 32 uh, points. And they try to replicate the, even just the search strategy uh, and that fell apart completely. And hard, hard to judge from the from the outside. I didn't, you know, try to then re-replicate this, uh, but was a fairly compelling criticism of of the methodology of arriving uh, at the um, uh, at the those thirty two guidelines and our, our checklist points in the first place. I still think it's really useful to kind of look through and see are there things that maybe I can include in my uh, reporting. Um, so so I would warn against using it as a peer review guide, but I would encourage you to have it in front of you when you're writing up focus group or interview-based research. That's kind of my personal perspective on it. <laughs> awesome, thank you. And that was the last question that we had in the chat. Were there any questions that we have from our panelists to each other that you guys come from different backgrounds? Throw it back to you. I have a, a question. Um, just uh, with Sebastian, your uh, talk uh, and your presentation, it was very informative, but it just makes me wonder if there's a guide that exists uh, that qualitative researchers can uh use and access easier than maybe this like webinar recording or are there any kind of support uh, system that uh, yeah there's various options so um and and i know there's a bunch of expertise in the audience so please put your favorite uh resources uh, that i'm not thinking of right now in the chat um so one that we created is uh is uh, the, that website managing qualitative data uh, that we created for the SSRC for their then still existing International Dissertation Research Fellowship uh, doctoral uh, uh, students. And that essentially goes through the entire research process uh, about managing data, but has a dedicated module on data sharing that has a lot of the things uh, I talked about today covered with exercises and further resources, et cetera. So that's uh, one kind of nicely comprehensive uh, place to look. Um, and then again, there are lots of people who want to help you with this. If you are at a university, you have a data librarian, they will want to help you with this. You can contact us at QDR um, and and, so there are definitely help out there. Right, there's uh, the um, resource that um, uh, that Rachel just shared um, that I, that I think some of us worked on. Gotten about that. Awesome, thank you. So back to you, Krista. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, thank thank you, panelists, uh, for coming today for sharing this. It, I always really enjoy webinars like this because I feel like even though I'm I'm steeped in a lot of these conversations, I always learn something new. So thank you for sharing, um, audience members for sharing papers, um, and for the panelists for sharing your expertise. Um, it's great to know that funders are paying attention to these conversations and that um, people are open to having talks about how people manage different kinds of data and the different kinds of, of concerns and questions and considerations that qualitative researchers um, have when when trying to engage in open science practices. So thank you all. Um, and um, we really appreciate you guys for coming out today. This was an excellent audience. Thank you for all of your questions.
and a video will be provided on the YouTube channel for the Center for Open Science uh, with a recording of this webinar. So if you missed parts of it, um, it's definitely here. Or you want to reference it back or share it with friends. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.